Well, thank you, everyone. I'm Louis Liu, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Eigen Technologies. We're an uh, artificial intelligence company based in London, New York, serving a wide range of different financial institutions, law firms, insurance companies, uh, focused specifically, actually, on natural language processing. And I think there's a, there's a lot of hype, and for good reason, about AI today. Uh, there's a lot of great things you can you can do today and a lot of great things you can do in the future. Uh, but I'm actually not really here to talk about that. I'm actually here to talk about what are the bottlenecks, what are the real sort of pain points of, of AI, and, 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 you know, and, and how do you actually think about that. So if you're a nerd like me, uh, you, you would have read um, Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, and in this book, uh, as, as you might know, there is a a uh, group of pan-dimensional hyper-intelligent species who wanted to ask the question, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of the universe? What is the meaning of everything? And so they commissioned this computer called Deep Thought. Um, and, you know, they, they build it, you know, and, and the computer is supposed to ingest every piece of information in the universe. And, and they, they actually take 7.5 million years to come up with the answer. What is the answer? Well, it's, 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 it's 42, clearly. And, uh, you know, the, the whole part of this story, which is around, uh, well, what does that answer really mean? Why does the Earth exist, et cetera? That, that's a story for another time. But what, what is that question? You know, what is this question? You know, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of everything? It, it, it's something what I call a, a what, what we call an N equals all question. What it is is that in this machine, you know, deep thought, it ingests every piece of information in the universe to try to compute something, right? And you know what, what, what's interesting here uh, is that uh, what's interesting here is that um, certain theories of information theory says that actually such a machine is actually the universe itself, which, which you, know, you can sort of debate about. But but let's consider what is an n equals all problem. Uh, an n equals all problem is a type of problem in which, is, you know, given the scope of the problem, uh, you have all the data points available to make some kind of assessment. So if I were to ask the question, you know, what, what is the percentage of people in this room who wear a white shirt? Let's say it's around 40% here. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, and that is an n equals all question with an n equals all answer. I can individually count every single person here. But the real world is far more complex. So let's say I was trying to ask the question, what, at this moment in time, what is the total number of people in the world wearing uh, a white shirt? Uh, I mean, that, that's impossible at this moment in time. I mean, you hope, you know, maybe with surveillance data and visual recognition can do it, but right now, today, we can't. And I can say, actually, why don't I make an approximation? I mean, I have roughly, 100 people here, 40%. Okay, so the world is about 40% people wearing white shirts at this moment. Well, that's clearly wrong. And, and you, you can start seeing how, you know, even just the bias sampling can actually create incorrect results. And, and that is why it is so difficult to go from the sampling, which is an n equals sum problem, to an n equals all problem. So what, is this, what does this really mean? And, and uh, you know, this means that actually most of the data that we have, that we sample, are actually incomplete. And, and, and two years ago, McKinsey actually did a uh, very interesting study that showed that only 1% of the world's data has actually been analyzed. That's 99% of data in which has just not been analyzed, has not even been looked at. And as you know, we continuously exponentially, you know, exponentially generate data on an ongoing basis globally. And there's got to be you know, a reason for this. I mean, we have really powerful computers. We have Amazon Cloud. W why is it only really 1%? And the reason is because unlike deep thought, where it is this all-seeing, all-powerful machine that can ingest every single type of data, uh, our machines can only ingest data in certain formats, in, in databases, Excel files, uh, you know, um, if, if you have an image recognition program, you know, dot JPEGs, et cetera, right? So, so, so data need to be structured in a specific way in order to be consumed by most of machine learning AI algorithms today. Uh, 
So let's consider one that, that's very, that we, at, at Eigen, we know quite intimately. So um, I mentioned before, we serve a wide range of law firms and banks. And, 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 and as you know, most of the law firms, most banks, uh, you know, contain, you know, millions of documents, of contracts, of agreements, of emails. And all these documents of, you know, are not, you know, are, are, are basically still in the database today, still look like that. Right? They, they've, they've not been sorted through, they've not been analyzed, they've not been converted into a format in which a machine can understand. And why is that? I mean, text, for example, is extremely difficult because of the number of permutations and subtleties that a human language contains. So how do we do that? Well, one of the very interesting things that, that we do at Eigen is, is we, we actually do convert uh, text. In, in this case, this is an is there agreement. Uh, some of you might know it as a very common form of derivatives contract. And we convert that into a, um, in some kind of mathematical structure. Uh, this is actually the math format of an is there agreement. Uh, but, but actually, we, we were able to extract certain, out, you know, certain types of mathematical features out of the language in which we convert, go from is does to that to this which everyone will recognize as an Excel spreadsheet, a, a data table, which you can then feed into you know, anything you want from, from the APIs and data robot through to Excel, uh, through to you know, R, et cetera. And then you can actually then deploy most of the tools of machine learning AI today. But that process is very, is, is very challenging. And that's all great. That, that's all really, really cool. You know, we, we, can, we can do all this stuff, we can do all this data conversion, and we can slowly get that 1% up to 2%, up to 3%. That's great. But what is a true stumbling block and a true bottleneck today? And that, that's what I'm really here to talk about. So, you know, this is a picture of a bee. Uh, that's sort of obvious. Um, and there's a uh, University of Quebec computer scientist, David Namir, who says, what I'm really looking forward to as the next step is not human level intelligence, but B level intelligence. And we're not yet there yet. I mean, that's fascinating. And, and I mean, let, let, let's consider sort of the three both stumbling blocks, bottlenecks, and the three levers that we need to pull to perhaps get to B and then human intelligence. The first is data. I've, I've talked about it already. Data needs to be in a format in which your machine learning algorithms can understand. Let's talk about the second point, algorithms. So there have been, been fantastic great advancements in mathematics, but actually a lot of the underlying neural network set of mathematics is actually quite old. And actually, how can you think about math in a new way? And actually, this is something that you know, we at Eigen try to do, to say, actually, can you a analyze this data in a private, limited environment when you actually don't have a, that much data to begin with, right? It's sort of a chicken-egg problem between algorithms and the data. And I think, finally, probably the most salient point here is processing power. So a B contains about one billion neural connections, one billion synapses. Um, that's about the amount of uh, computing power that, uh, that most super powerful computers have today. But a human, has about 100 trillion to 150 trillion synapses. That is, that is orders of magnitudes. Um, uh, that, that, that is orders of magnitudes. Sorry. That is orders of magnitudes beyond what, what we have today. And this is why you know, the excitement is really about B level intelligence next. And by the way, a B can, can fly, can navigate, can socialize, and you don't, you don't even have to debug it. Uh, so so what, what, what is the upshot of this? Well, uh, I'll talk about one very explicit experience we've had here at Eigen. Uh, we were serving a major bank uh, where we had to help them comply with a, a, a particular piece of U.S. regulation where you actually had to analyze the entire trading book of this bank. So that's up to a million documents uh, answering about uh, you know, a very large range of different legal questions, simple questions like governing law to much more complex questions like cross default, downgrade triggers, etc. And we did, we did, we did a, a benchmarking exercise across 12,000 data points. And we showed that after four iterations of humans, and these are, by the way, trained humans, uh, lawyers, paralegals, we, we've achieved about, they achieved about 92% accuracy. Um, so next time, 
you know, think about the quality of your data in your database, you know, four iterations. What's really interesting is we have did a similar benchmarking exercise uh, running our machine, and then our machine would actually highlight areas in which when the machine is not certain, we send it for humans. The machine out of the box achieved 91%, but then totally we got 98%. Again, the upshot is that a machine plus a human is substantially, they are substantially more accurate and more robust than a human alone or a machine alone. And I think that's really where you know, the, the, the future is, at least certainly for the next five to ten years. So, you know, uh, we've been sponsored by a law firm, so I guess I'll ask the question, what is the meaning of life for a lawyer? And, well, let, let, let's take a junior lawyer, uh, for, for example. I think, I think the future of a, of, a, of, a, of a lawyer, of junior lawyer, five to ten years from now, is not one of going through, you know, taking samples of a document in the data room, uh, or, or, on, or on a portfolio, but actually you know, sticking everything in and being able to visualize, being able to understand, being able to comprehend everything that's in that, uh, you know, converting that n equals sum problem to an n equals all problem for that particular situation and scenario you're running into. And what's powerful about that? Well, a couple of points. The, the first is there is a shift, there will be a shift, and I think, in the skill set for a lawyer. So a, 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 a junior lawyer, for example, will still have to be very smart about the legals, still need to be very good with language. But I think a third point, I think a junior lawyer of the future will need to be good at numbers. Will need to be able to actually understand statistics and be able to, you know, dive into the numbers as to why certain things exist. Because you go from, you know, a case-by-case case situation into an n equals all situation. Another really important, interesting point is that a, 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 the lawyer, junior lawyer, an associate lawyer of the future will probably have more knowledge than a partner today. Why do we pay senior partners of top-tier law firms? Why do we bill? Why do they bill about a thousand pounds an hour? It's because they have a lot of experience. They've done fifty deals, a hundred deals of, of you know. Of, of a certain variety, so you can say they can say you tell you tell you, this is market standard. This is not market standard. But what if a law firm can actually analyze every single contract and every stage of negotiation they've gone through, and an associate will be able to have that on his or her fingertips? I mean, that means that an associate of the future has more knowledge than a partner of today. And certainly, well, I don't think that answers the. Uh, meaning of life for a lawyer in the future, but I think it's a place to start. Thank you.